Just let it be for you, for you only My whole life, all for your glory Today we're going to continue on looking through uh, Genesis And I, I'm not going to have uh, any of the really the verses up here for you guys So if you really want to follow along We're actually going to go through all of Genesis chapter 24 Verses 1 through 67, so it's a lot of verses to cover, but it's one long story that it's important that we kind of get this context and, and what's really happening with this. And, and one of the takeaways that I think is really important about this is uh, Rebecca, who is really featured in this story, becomes one of these Old Testament heroines, you know, these, these people that bring to us a, a vitality of the story of God and His action in Israel. And, uh, you know, a lot of times I think we filter this story in a way that we forget how important uh, the women of the Old Testament were in fulfilling God's purpose and plan. And uh, so this, this kind of comes out to me as I read just the importance of Rebecca uh, above the cultural expectations of what maybe women would have been expected to in inheritance. And it's, it's kind of neat. Ultimately, as I go, as I was thinking through this, how really countercultural the New Testament is in terms of the women uh, having an equal inheritance. But I think that really is rooted in the history of the Scripture, that there's this super cultural context for male and female, made in the image of God, as we talked about, both reflecting the glory and beauty and majesty of God. And for me, I see a lot of that come out in the subtleties of this story. So just kind of keep that in the back of your minds as we go through this, just how neat it is to see God use, um, you know, both men and women in the Old Testament to fulfill His purpose because both were created in His, in his image. And there's some key little parts that I'll pull out here or there. But let me just start by reading in Genesis chapter 24 and set the stage for what's going to happen here. So Abraham's getting older, it tells us, and now this whole idea of inheritance, we've talked a lot about this and lineage and what you pass on. We've talked again and again because these are so key. So he's getting old and he's starting to think about, okay, how do I fulfill this legacy that God has called me to? Well, you know, I've got a son. Finally, after all the drama that that was, we saw how, you know, he couldn't have a kid with his wife because they were old and made some dumb decisions and... Then finally he has a kid, and then God says, oh yeah, sacrifice your kid. And it's just this test of faith. Goes through all this dramatic sort of life experience. Decades waiting for God to fulfill his promise, not knowing how God's going to fulfill it. And then finally God reveals things as they go along. Now he's old, and it says this. Now Abraham was old and well advanced in years, and Yahweh had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh that I may make you swear by Yahweh, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell, but will go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife for my son Isaac. The servant said to him, perhaps the woman may not be willing to follow me to the land. That means coming back here. Uh, must I then take your son back to the land from which you came? So Abraham said to him, See to it that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, who spoke to me and swore to me, To your offspring I will give this land. He will send his angel before you, and, he shall take, uh, and you shall take a wife for my son from there. But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from my oath of mine, only you must take my, not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. So I think there's a couple interesting aspects to this. So we see Abraham getting this idea. He does not want his son Isaac to have a woman from among the Canaanites. So why? Well, we've talked again. There's this idolatry, this worship of false gods and religion that he doesn't want his son Isaac influenced by. He wants his son to be a follower of Yahweh, to walk in the ways of God. Because we've seen historically already going through the Old Testament that you know, families get off track, right? It's easy to get off track from where you're going when you marry into a situation where there's not agreement about the direction you're going. 
So if you get married and somebody's, you know, going left and you want to go right, there's a conflict. And, uh, and Abraham wants to make sure his son Isaac, who will be the inheritor of God's promise, is rightly married to somebody who will help him fulfill God's purpose and not distract him. But will even do more than that, will be a positive influence in following Yahweh's direction. So he entrusts his, his oldest servant, uh, the guy who's in charge of all Abraham's household as well. So this guy is really, uh, the word here is like an elder, essentially. Somebody who's wise and Abraham trusts implicitly with this job of going back to his land and traveling there. And so he gives them this charge. Now, it's really interesting. Just as a side note, this is always a fun one. I think I've mentioned this before. I know my wife loves it when I bring this up. But in uh, verse, where are we? verse 2, he says, hey, I want you to swear this oath. And he says, I want you to put your hand under my thigh that I may swear this oath to Yahweh. So he uses this covenant name of God. A couple important things. The name of Yahweh, God, is this covenant name of God. So this isn't just an oath of promise. It would be within the cultural framework. You know, everyone understood what an oath was. But he's saying an oath to Yahweh, the God of my covenant. So by bringing his servant in to this, making this oath, he's saying you're not just swearing it to me, but to Yahweh, the God, the creator God, who has established this whole f- future for me, and you are a big part of God's future plan. Now, under his thigh is a sort of a euphemism, probably most likely, uh, for basically uh, maybe grabbing hold of his genitals there and, uh, you know, touching this intimate part of his body. So you say, that's disgusting. Well, it sort of is, especially from our, all, our cultural perspective. And even to the, you know, they didn't want to write that word there, so they have this sort of euphemism for grabbing a hold of the genitals by saying, put your hand under my thigh. So, and this is speculation a little bit because, I mean, it could have been like the upper thigh maybe, but it's mostly, it's, it's probable that this is what really was happening. And there's a reason for this. This is important culturally. We have to understand this. And think about the, the whole context of what's going on here. God has promised to Abraham an inheritance, and that comes through the children. So by swearing this oath, it is basically an oath about inheritance. So the genitals reflecting that idea of inheritance. That's where the seed of life, so to speak, comes from, right? So he's making this commitment about life. And it's connected to this source of life and inheritance. So it's not like a small thing is the idea here. I mean, for one dude to touch another dude there, it's got to be pretty significant, right? I mean, there's got to be something going on there that's, uh, that's pretty important. So I think... And when we get that framework in mind of how important this is, the covenant swearing to Yahweh, this oath that he doesn't want broken, and doing an act like this that is so significant, at least, I mean, it was certainly to their culture too, but for us it seems really radically significant to do something like that. This is a big deal to set this stage for this whole story. Now, again, he wants them to go and make this promise. He says, well, what if the, what if the woman, I find one, and she doesn't want to come back? That could be a problem. So should I take your son on this journey back so that she can meet him and maybe then she'll be, and he's like, no. Angels give me this promise. It's going to happen. But, and if it doesn't happen, you're, you're released from the oath. You don't have to worry about it. But whatever you do, don't take my son there. And whatever you do, this is not, don't bring him from Canaan, but don't take my son there. These are the important things. So I've got a question for you just with that little bit of framework. As you look at this servant, um, what do you think, what qualities in this guy help make this servant um, the head of Abraham's great wealth? What were the qualities that qualified him for the guy to be entrusted with such a significant oath? Can you pick up little things within that story maybe that, that tell you, okay, this guy had the qualities necessary? Anything? What's that? Loyalty. Loyalty, yeah. He was a loyal guy over time, right? It wasn't just like a guy said, eh, you, you know. <laughs> I just met you last week. I'm going to trust you with that. Yeah. That's a big one. Understanding his relationship with Yahweh and who that was. What other qualities do you think stick out for this guy? You asked this question on the heels of what you just talked about. Yeah. On the heels, no. Which is another often euphemism in the New Testament. 
They definitely trust. Yeah. Yeah. There's an intimacy there that maybe we just <laughs> we don't quite grasp from our cultural perspective. Yeah. Some definite trust in that. Uh, yeah, I think that's, that's a big one, right? By the way, just as a, as a side note, just, this is a fun, this isn't even part, this is just for fun. Uh, this is where my wife gets worried when I say stuff like that. But uh, in studying this and looking at this a little bit more this last week too, um, there's another passage, uh, we haven't, we'll get to this later on, when Moses is going back to the promised land and some of you that know the story, he's going to free his, the people. And God has this whole thing about circumcision. Well, his son wasn't circumcised, and his wife uh, circumcises their kid along the way, and she takes out the foreskin, and she, and she says she, uh, she touches his feet with it, you know, and then says, you are a bridegroom of blood to me. That's actually probably also another passage of a euphemism. She probably touches his genitals with the foreskin of his son. It's like this whole symbolic thing of life, and seed and future that traces throughout the Old Testament. So there's all kinds of, actually, potentially variety of passages where this is a big deal culturally. Um, the only reason I'm emphasizing that part of it, not, aside from that it's funny, uh, is there are some cultural things that I want to start picking up here because there's a question we'll deal with later in terms of how does God use our culture and the things of our culture to accomplish his purposes. So we're going to get to that question later, but you can start thinking about it now uh, because I, I find that fascinating. But yeah, so this servant, definitely somebody who's loyal, has demonstrated his trust, th- that he's trustworthy, right, over time. He's proven this over a long period. He's been entrusted with small things and then bigger things, now everything. So this is now the most significant thing in Abraham's life. So he picks somebody who's the most trusted guy. So he goes. And so the the passage picks up in verse 10. It says, then the servant, by the way, his name is Eliezer. He's mentioned other places, but he's not named in this entire passage. And I think that's important because although he's the most trusted servant, I think the emphasis here is not on him as an individual, but him as a trusted representative. He's representing Abraham in this whole thing. So his name is never used in this section. So it gets hard to follow sometimes because he says, he said, and then he said, and he said. And it's one of these things where you got kind of forget who's being the he in this sometimes. So you have to track along with these stories uh, some, when, in cases like this where they don't give those names. So it says the servant took ten of his master's camels and departed. Again, emphasizing that servant-master relationship that was so important. There's somebody following and there's somebody who's leading in this relationship. uh, And they're following through. So he took ten of his master's camels and departed, taking all sorts of choice gifts from his master. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahor. So let me real quick throw up a slide that just shows the sort of map of this. Bam. Oh, I threw what word did. I click? Is that, is that the secret to it? Okay, there we go. So basically, he's just coming from right down here where it says like in the Hebron area. He's going the whole way up there to that very top of the map there. This is a map of somebody of uh, Jacob's travels, but this, this was the cleanest map I had that like shows from way down here in Hebron, way down there south, way up north. It's about a 500-mile trek probably. So how many of you guys ever made a road trip for 500 miles, right? We take that usually in cars. That's a long trip, right? This is probably, you know, I mean, with 10 camels and all kinds of wealth, where anywhere along the way they could be, you know, robbed or attacked. So they got to take enough people to protect this great wealth. Camels were not like a a necessarily a common animal, animal. So this is pretty a sign of great wealth even have the camels, let alone all the good stuff that he's bringing with it. So we're talking like four, maybe six months journey to make this trip. So it just sort of says, hey, he went and away, he went there. You know, so it's one of those Bible things where it says a couple words, you think, oh, he took a little trip. Oh, that's nice. No, he's like a six-month journey to make this trip, which even brings to light more of what happened earlier. It's like, hey, if she says no, should I take your son? So then he'd have to travel there, take the camels. He's like, do you want me to come back for another six-month trip, pick up your son, then go back another six-month trip, take him so just so we can convince her to come back, and then have to come back again. So this guy was committed. Right? He's going all in on this trip. He's like, I'm doing whatever it takes. 
you can see this guy's commitment level is really high. So he goes and he takes that trip, and he says, the young woman, uh, sorry, uh, oh, skipped a page, where am I at? Oh, yeah. So uh, he went on this trip. Okay, verse 11. And he made the camels kneel down outside the well. So he's like, he made the trip six months, all in like one verse. That was really cool. Uh, so he makes the trip, and he gets there, and the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of the water at the time of the evening, when the time when women go out to draw water, because it's cooler, not in the heat of the day, go get the water from the well. And he said, O oh, Yahweh, God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show steadfast love or show, or show steadfast love to my master Abraham. So now again, calling on this covenant name of Yahweh, the oath he's taking, God, Yahweh, of this covenant of my master Abraham, recognizing these lines of authority and direction in life. I'm following through with my covenant based on the covenant you made. You know, it's, it's just this great relationship that he's outlining. And that word steadfast love, we've talked about that before. This is this word hesed. It's this term, uh, I like the term covenant love myself for it because it's emphasizing this arrangement, this legal arrangement that God has made, but it's rooted in God's loving relationship. So all through this passage, it's very key that this servant is emphasizing that everything I do here, God, Yahweh, the personal covenant name of God, is based on this covenant you have made, this promise you have made and established with Abraham. He says, Behold, I am standing in the spring of water, and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Let the young woman to whom I say, Please let down your jar that I may drink, and who shall say, Drink, and I will water your camels. So let her be the one you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to my master. So he's saying, look, I'm gonna, the women are going to come out. I'm going to say to one of them, hey, can you give me a drink of water? And she's going to have to you know, lower this jar, get me the water. And, and in addition to that, she will offer, without me asking, hey, can I water your camels? So he's like, that's going to be my test. This is how I'm going to know this is the woman. This is very interesting. You know, It's like sort of like a... You know, it, to us, this, is, this seems kind of random, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But so he goes this, Before he had finished speaking, behold, Rebekah, who was born in Beth, to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with her, uh, came out with her water jar uh, on her shoulder. So let me pause there and set this. So we, the reader, have this bit of information that the servant of Abraham does not have. And what is that? We know her lineage now. He doesn't know this yet. He just sees an attractive young woman coming out. All right, I'm going to start with her and, you know, the first one out. So just going to start asking the question, hey, can I have a drink of water? And we're going to see what goes on here. But let's just, I want to give us this perspective because to the, to the Hebrews who are reading this, they would get what's happening here. There's a, there's a buildup in this story uh, that we get to view as the reader that this character in the story doesn't know quite yet. So I have one more slide for you guys. And this is just a little lineage one. Click. See, it works. Oh, my gosh. It's like magic. You discovered the trick. So in this one, it's kind of interesting because basically what we have here. Ooh, look, I block it. So we have, we have Abraham over here, right? And he had two brothers. Um, and so this is where we get one of, out of one of his brothers came Lot out of this line. And then here we have Bethuel right here, who is, there's Laban and then there's Rebekah, right? So really, Rebekah right here is, comes from this granddad over here who is the father of Abraham. And it comes down, so there's a family lineage there that's connected, Okay? So what's kind of important for the reader to see is this isn't just a woman coming out to well. We know this now. She is actually, when Abraham said, go among my kinsmen and find a wife for my son, Abraham, his, his direction was pretty explicit. But this servant has no idea who this woman is, but the charge is to find a woman who will be of his family line. See, again, it's all about lineage and passing on and inheritance. So now we see the reader, whoa, this woman, this young lady that's coming out, she fits the bill so far, as far as family lineage. But we don't know if she's still the right woman out of that family line. That We'll see. So that's what we know as the reader coming in. So the young woman was very attractive in appearance, a maiden whom had no, who had no man had known. So she was a virgin. 
uh, young maiden, virgin, basically of age that she could have kids. So that we know this, there's a variety, three different words used here to describe her as a young lady. Uh, a maiden basically means she could have kids. She was of childbearing years and she was a virgin that we know this and so she had not been with a guy. Again, he didn't know that looking at her necessarily, but uh, we are afforded this information as the reader. This is who this, this woman is. So the servant ran to meet her and said, please give me a little water to drink from your jar. She said, drink, my Lord. And she quickly let down her jar upon her hand and gave him a drink. When she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels also until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran again to the well to draw water. And she drew for all her camels. So there's an urgency in this whole scene that's being set up. He runs to her and then she quickly lets down the jar. And then she runs to the well and she's quickly doing this. There's this sense of like these people are, are making, an, she's making an effort really to have hospitality. Now, what have we ter- learned about hospitality so far in this cultural context of the Old Testament? What, what do we know about that, right? It's, it's everything, right? See, this is why I think this is one of these little insights into this story that is very important. What do we know about Abraham? And what was the difference between, say, him and Lot in some of these stories when they responded to people, strangers in the land? What was one of the marks that we knew that this was a guy who was following God versus this is a guy who maybe was not following God? It was hospitality, right? That was a big marker of somebody who was worthy of following this call. So it was a cultural custom of hospitality, but it was used to demonstrate that they were following in obedience to what Yahweh had done. So the fact that Rebecca is showing not just generosity to him by following, she's showing great hospitality, over-the-top hospitality, as did Abraham. So we're seeing that she's somebody who is really worthy of being the wife of Isaac and can take on this line. This is why I say it's one of these subtle parts of the story that show her to be the sort of the heroine of the story. Because she's being shown uh, on par with somebody like Abraham. She has the hospitality that Abraham had. She has all these qualities that we've seen marked Abraham out as a man of faith, worthy of this covenant relationship that God had that that is living out that call in a worthy manner. So we start to see these qualities in her as well. So she searched that. So uh, she quickly emptied her jar into the trough, ran again to the well, drawn more water. The man gazed at her in silence to learn whether Yahweh had prospered his journey or not. So he's just watching and saying, God, is this the one? Is this really the one? Is like she going to finish it? Like maybe she'll get like halfway. Uh, I did five camels. That's enough. I'm done. You know? So does she really have this endurance to follow through? So when the camels had finished drinking, the man took a gold ring, weighed a half shekel, and two bracelets from her arm, for her arms and weighed the ten gold shekels. And said, please tell me whose daughter you are. Is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? So now he wants to know her family inheritance and will she continue the hospitality by taking them in. So this is no small task because she's got to put up him, all the servants that are with them. This is not just like a guy, and a, you know, is like bringing his little chihuahua in a bag, you know. It's like, this is like a big deal, right? So they can put feed them and hay. This is serious request. Right, so she says to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor. Now remember, she has no idea who this guy is either, that she, he's coming on behalf of Abraham, and that they've got this family lineage that's all connected. Nobody knows any of this yet, and now the servant kind of starts to know, oh my gosh, this is great. So she added, we have plenty of both straw and fodder and room to spend the night. So she's like, yeah, absolutely, no problem. I see all your camels and all your dozens of people with you and all that stuff. Psh, we got no problem. So the man bowed his head and worshipped Yahweh. See, if you don't get all the other stuff, you say, why is he doing this? He bowed his head and worshipped Yahweh and said, Blessed be Yahweh, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his steadfast love, his hesed, and his faithfulness towards my master. As for me, Yahweh has led me in the way of the house of my master's kinsman. Then the young woman ran and told her mother's household about these things. So he sees it like, wow, she fits everything everything that Abraham said she should be. She has these 
generous. She's hospitable. She's met this test that I've set up for God to do. And she happens to be related to my master as he wanted. And she's attractive. She's hot too. So I mean, it's like everything. She's like the full deal. She's like the, she's like the full package for this guy, right? So he's like praising God. He falls down. It's like he's about to have me. He's falling down on the ground praising Yahweh. Now, it's interesting because he does this in front of her. So he's, you know, praising Yahweh, the name of God. He's doing this in front of her. And I think that has some uh, importance for the rest of the story as we go. But there's, a, there's three questions I want us to pause right here and take on at our tables. And I had to run these by my wife a little bit yesterday because they're really wordy. And I just, I struggled to f- kind of phrase these in a way that would get the right kind of conversation going. So hopefully I can help frame these right. All right, so my first question is this. Does it seem hard to believe to you guys that Yahweh, the God of heaven and earth, would allow his grand plan of salvation to hinge on such an insignificant event as a girl choosing to water some camels? See, that jumps out as weird to me. Here's God who created everything. You know, Genesis, in the beginning, God said, boom, and it all was, right? He makes this covenant because there's sin. He's like, I'm going to have a plan of salvation that leads to Jesus Christ. And everything's going to hinge on a woman, whether she decides, ah, I'm going to water some camels or not. Does that seem weird to you that such an insignificant event? I mean, you'd think like if God has this grand plan, you want to see like palaces and kings and, you know, I mean, you want like big stuff to happen, right? You want to see big events. Yet the Old Testament spends a bunch of space. I mean, this is like one of the longest narratives in Genesis. These 64, this is one of the longest narratives with a lot of detail. This is a pretty significant one, all about this young woman, Rebecca, essentially. So she takes this central place in God's grand scheme, and it all hinges on, okay, God, if you find me a woman, let her feed, you know, you know, feed and water my camels. So I don't know. Talk, uh, does that make sense, what I'm asking? Like, it seems, like, amazing to me. So I've got, the second question is this. If God had already chosen Rebecca to marry Isaac, so if this was God's plan, and she was the woman, like, because the servant's like, hey, thanks, God, this is the woman you brought me to, Right? And if this was an arranged marriage, so in the culturally speaking, she was supposed, you know, like, hey, the men are going to talk, hey, I'll have your daughter marry my guy, and yay, okay, done, deal set, kind of thing. So if it's all that, uh, did Rebecca even have a free choice to marry? I think that's interesting because both of those questions, I guess what I'm really kind of driving at is, as we look at our own lives, before we get to our lives, I just want us to look at this story, but... But ultimately, in the back of your head, to be thinking like about the small events in our own life, I think sometimes have more significance than we think they do to God. And if God has a plan for us, does that mean that I have free choice or am I obligated to do that? So what's Rebecca's really role in this? I mean, if, if all the men are making the decisions and God had a plan for her, did she have any like say in what happened? Or is she just a sort of a pawn and God's like, aha, I'm moving the piece here kind of thing? What? What do you think that, how does that work? And the third question is, how did God use the culture of these ancient people to fulfill his eternal purpose that was beyond culture? What do you think the role of culture was in this? Because we've seen a lot of odd practices, a lot of things about hospitality, and our culture is very different, but how did he use culture? You know, uh, a lot of times we talk about the uh, big famous book years ago was called Pagan Christianity, and this how like, oh, certain practices were adopted from these pagan cultures. The truth is, there's not too much in the Old Testament that wasn't adapted in some way from pagan cultures. There's a lot that God uses, which I find fascinating. How does God use it? Uh, how does he use the culture? Because if we don't understand how he's using the Old Testament, I think we get messed up in how he can potentially use our culture to do our life. So all these have connections for us that I want us to drive at, but I didn't want to just jump to, hey, how does it use, apply to my life before we really kind of discuss a little bit about this story, okay? So go ahead and, and kind of work through those three questions as best you can, and then uh, we'll come back together in a little bit. Okay. Well, I know that we could take a lot longer at our tables on this, and uh, we could do a lot more. But let me summarize this, uh, my thoughts on this this way, of, of, of these three things. I do think it's amazing that God can use these small things 
to accomplish such great eternal purposes. And like these little tiny stories and like little subtle things. And, and it is a reminder to me, like God cares about the little details in our lives. Because in those details is where his grand plans often find their beginning or fulfillment in the details of our lives. And so the, the choices you and I make on a daily basis to reflect God and demonstrate God to the world around us really matter to him. And the other side of this, at least my take on this, especially the cultural piece to this, I think what we see happen here is that uh, God uses the, a cultural expectation of this kind of hospitality that does have a match with God's character. So it's not just using any cultural practice. It's using a cultural practice that specifically has a connection to God's nature and to God's character. But it also has a significance and it connects Rebecca to the kind of family that Abraham has established. So we see that that, that cultural, that test that the servant puts out is not just a random test. It doesn't, it's, not, it's actually not as random as it looks, I guess, is the idea. That it had a significance for the life, for the family of Abraham specifically. It, as was brought at our table, it's sort of a, even in a family that maybe was idol worshiping, there was a, there was a shared value for caring for the stranger, which we know is of extreme value in what God has established with Abraham. So if she can demonstrate these qualities that connect with their family, then this servant's going to know there's a match. But I think the other side to that, it wasn't just, so it wasn't random. It connected with their family. It showed that there was a shared value system that he could say, okay, this is good. But there was a confirmation in that beyond just the culture. And that was that she was of the line of Abraham's ancestry. So that's something that he couldn't control. So I have a feeling had, you know, 10 women come out and said, oh, we're willing to do this. And if he found out that they weren't of Abraham's family, he would say, no, it's not the right thing. So it wasn't just a random test that he gave. He said, okay, here's something that connects. Here's this cultural thing that I'm going to look at that, that's pulled from a culture, but connects to the life of Abraham. And here's something that I can't control that goes beyond the culture, that's tied to the promise of God in our words, it's tied to the Word of God, right? It's tied to this, in, in our today, we could say, I have this sort of expectation. Here's how, God, I'm going to know it. But it's tied to your Word. It's not in violation of something that you've already revealed to me. So the servant, it's tied to that existing revelation of God, right? So he's putting these two things together to come up with how, God, how are you going to lead me? And I think there's an important lesson there for us, too. Is it's okay if we put out to God, because we had this little discussion, too, at our table. It's okay, I think, if we say to God, hey, God, if this is you, show me by this. Give me this sign. And we could throw something out. But that better be in line with what he's already revealed in his word. And I'm not saying test God. This is not a test of God. Prove to me you love me by giving me a Maserati. You know, that is not really going to go over too well. But I'm saying if there's things that we expect to see, I think God was clear about this all throughout prophecy in the Old Testament. There was always this future fulfillment of prophecy, but it was always accompanied by some sort of immediate fulfillment. So God said, hey, I'll give you a sign. A virgin shall bear a son, and you call his name Emmanuel. Well, that was a promise that wasn't fulfilled for a thousand plus years, but at the same time, there was an immediate fulfillment by somebody giving birth that they would know by some tangible thing in the present, there was a future reality that would come. Abraham has that all along, right? Hey, you are going to be the father of many nations. Okay, God, I'll take just one kid, you know, at some point. But as God fulfilled things in his life along the way, he knew that the future fulfillment of those things were guaranteed. So I think this is what we're seeing here, is how God operates. God is saying, let me give you this little sign... Give me, okay, this is how I'll know from my cultural perspective, from my life. Here's our value system. Here's what I'll know. But this will be tied to some sort of eternal, transcultural promise that then I can have assurance that this is you, God, speaking to me. Because we ask, how, God, how do I know it's God? Well, he speaks from his written word, but he can also use little details in our life. But those little details better match up with what he's revealed to us or else we're going to get misled. 
That's how we know it's the voice of God or just our own voice or the voice of the culture or the voice of God or the voice of the devil, right, and God, right? Those are the differences. So those match up. So let me go on. Verse 29. Rebekah had a brother whose name was Laban. Laban ran out towards the man to the spring. As soon as he saw the ring and the bracelets on his sister's arms and heard the words of Rebekah, his sister, thus the man spoke to me, he went to the man, and behold, he was standing in the camels at the spring. He said, Come in, O blessed of Yahweh. Why do you stand outside? For I have prepared the house and a place for camels. So the man came to the house and unharnessed the camels and gave straw and fodder to the camels, and there was water to wash the feet and the feet of the men who were with him. So the thing about Laban is really interesting. So basically the, the text kind of leads us to say, like, Laban came and he saw this, like, very expensive jewelry. And there's a sense of his motivation is greed. We get that from this text. And later we see Laban does a lot of manipulation to Abraham's kids, right? We see these come out later. So we see in Laban early on this guy who's driven by some bad motivations. Yet... He's the guy who fulfills the hospitality expectation, and he's the guy that's all for the wedding. So here's my question. How is it that God used the guy motivated by greed to fulfill his plan? That's another side of this. So we saw how God could use culture, but what about this? Does that seem weird that God would rely on basically a guy's sinful motivation to be a part of still fulfilling his plan? What do you think about that? Thoughts? Joseph and his brothers, yeah. Pharaoh and the Exodus used his own motivations to get his own way out, right? See, now that brings it close to home, right? It's like, hey, it doesn't matter if their motives, are, as long as the gospel is the right message being preached, people have all kinds of motives. So don't worry about their motives as long as the substance of what they're saying is true to the Word of God. Now, we see people that instead of judging motive, they judge the substance, essentially, right? Isn't that interesting how God works that? That being sovereign in God, he's able to use a guy whose motives may be impure, yet he's able to use those impure things for great things. Reminds me of the passage, God works to good, you know, for good all things to those who love him, right? That doesn't mean all things are good. So we take that passage out of context and somebody, you know, their kid was in a car accident and paralyzed for life. And we say, you know, God will work that for good. It's like, no, almost saying like, well, hey, it's a good thing that happened to you because God's going to be glorified. Yay. That's not what those things mean. It means that God can use corruption. He can use the culture. He can use sin. He can use obedience. He can use all those things to fulfill his purposes. So it's interesting then that Laban has that sort of role in this. So it says, Then the food was set before Abraham, servant, to eat. But he said, I will not eat until I have said what I have to say. So he spoke on these things. So basically, verses 34 through 37, 47, he repeats the story. You know, God made a promise to my master Abraham. He tells him the whole story again. We're not going to do it because we just read it. Uh, it's important, though. There are details in that story that are important. A couple things to keep in mind is retelling the story to us, the reader, affirms the truthfulness of these events. It's affirming that, that Yahweh has made this covenant. He's telling him these things to affirm the truthfulness of the story. But we pick up in 47, the second half of 47. So I put, so this is the servant speaking. So I put the ring in her nose. I love that part. And the bracelets on her arms. And then I bowed my head to worship Yahweh and blessed Yahweh, the God of my master Abraham, who had led me by the right way to take the daughter of my master's kinsman for his son. Now then, if you are going to show steadfast love, he's saying to Laban, if you are going to show chesed, if you are going to show this steadfast love and faithfulness to my master, tell me, and if not, tell me, that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. He's like, look, if you're going to do it, tell me. If you're not going to do it, either way, I'm out of here. Whether I take her with me or not, tell me what's... Are you going to be a part of fulfilling this covenant relationship? So, first thing that jumps out is, one, it was cool, because like when he gives her the ring and the bra bracelet for her, you're thinking, oh, a nice little finger ring. No, it's in her nose. So that's kind of cool, which is the title of my sermon, by the way, is uh, related to that, because I think it's awesome. Uh, Worthy of a nose ring um, is my title for this thing, because 
And the question I'm asking us, are we worthy of a nose ring from God? Uh, that's awesome. So, but he's asking this. So here's this symbol. These are the things, these bracelets and this little nose ring hanging out there. These are the symbols of this relationship that they begin to establish, but now they have to agree and consent to be a part of this. He's told them, this is not just a household idol we worship. This is God of heaven and earth, Yahweh, the creator God, who's made this covenant with Abraham. He tells them the whole deal. Then Laban and Bethuel, Laban and Bethuel answered and said, the thing that has come from Yahweh, we cannot speak to you good or bad. So the thing that, the whole covenant of God thing with God, Yahweh, ah, we can't speak to that. Uh, I don't know if it's good or bad. Because although it seems to be, and as I read this, there's no guarantee of this, so here's my take on this. I think that there is some awareness. They know, they, they remember, you know, Abraham's been gone 50 plus years at this point. So they know who Abraham is, obviously, because he's still part of the family. And they know he left because God called him. So they, they know who Yahweh is, at least to some degree. Whether it was, hey, remember Abraham, your brother? What a bonehead, man. He left for this God called him thing, you know. <laughs> but they do see he came back pretty wealthy, so something good must have happened. So we don't know about this Yahweh guy, but uh, we know you're wealthy now. So I don't know how much they knew Yahweh, how much they might have actually potentially been worshipers of Yahweh. I, I don't know. It's not really clear. Um, but it does seem that there is, even though Laban seems to be more Hey, it's good or bad. Again, his greed, it seems to be his more motive. But Rebecca seems to have, in my mind as I read this story, a little bit more understanding that this is Yahweh, the, who this God is, and wants to be a part of that. Uh, it's, it's, that's what comes across to me. Anyway, so behold, Rebecca is before you. Take her and go, and let, it, <laughs> let her be the wife of your master's son, as Yahweh has spoken. I don't know if it's God or not, but you got a lot of cool gifts, so take her and go. We're fine with that. So when Abraham's servant heard these words, he bowed himself to the earth before Yahweh, falls down on the ground, and the servant brought out jewelry of silver and gold and garments and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave her uh, to her brother and to her mother's costly ornaments, and, and, uh, and the men who were with him ate and drank, and they spent the night there. When they arose in the morning, he said, send me away to my master, her brother, and her mother said, let the young woman remain with us a while, at least 10 days, after that she may go. So like, yeah, I'll go, and he gives gifts, and they have a party in the morning, he's like, okay, we're out of here, and she's like, well, actually, can we just wait about 10 days, because I'm really, I know we said she could go, but I still want to hang out with her a little bit. She's my girl, you're going away a six-month trip, I'll probably never see her again, you know, we, we, we never to do girl stuff, girl time. So her brother and her mother said, uh, let the young woman remain with us a while. And then, uh, but he said to them, the servant, do not delay me since Yahweh has prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. They said, let us call the young woman and ask her. And they called Rebecca and said to her, will you go with this man? She said, I will go. So they sent Rebecca away, uh, their sister and her nurse and Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebecca and said to her, our sister, may you become thousands and ten thousands and may her offspring possess, possession, possess the gate of those who hate them. Then Rebekah and her young woman arose and rode on the camels and followed the man. Thus the servant took Rebekah and went his way. The significant out of this story is that she does have some choice in this. Somehow God, being God, is able to orchestrate his ultimate plan through, pe through using culture, through using greed, through using good things and bad things, and using free choice to accomplish the plan he had all along. She had a choice in this. She could have said, no, I don't want to go. She said, delayed or not. I mean, she clearly is somebody who's shown to have a decision in this. She's a woman of integrity, a woman of strength, a woman of character. And now she's a woman of faith and trusting that this Yahweh got out. I'm ready to go. Boom. Just like that. This is a, this is a strong, great woman. And there's parallels to her and Abraham. Because what was the call we see in Abraham? Abraham, pick up your family and go. So she's responding, I'm ready to go. There's, there's verbal cues that we get from this that Rebecca responded to God's call just like Abraham did. And just like Abraham had respect for, and hospitality for the stranger, when these people came in as strangers into their land, they were welcomed. She gave them hospitality. So on all levels, she's pictured as this female sort of counterpart in fulfilling God's call and God's purpose in Abraham. Really fascinating how that works. Now, last part of this passage. Now Isaac had returned from Ber, uh, Berlahai Roy and was dwelling in the Negev. And Isaac, this is the first time Isaac's mentioned, by the way. That's why Rebecca really is the star of this whole 
thing, this, this heroine of this whole thing, because Isaac's sort of like an afterthought. Like, oh, and by the way, Isaac's here. Uh, and Isaac lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, there were camels coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes. And when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel and said to the servant, who is that fine young man walking the field to meet us? And the servant said to his master, uh, she, he, that is my master. She took her veil and covered herself. So the cultural thing, she's having, you know, you know, modesty and following the cultural custom of this sort of day. And the servant told Isaac all the things that it had done. And Isaac brought her into the tent of Sarah, his mother, and told, took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was com uh, comforted after his mother's death. So this is a woman who brought him great comfort because she got to meet him before she died. Always a good thing. And she had this blessing. So that's sort of this afterthought closing to this narrative. But now I want to go back to this ring on the nose thing. I love that part. I love the weird parts of the passages, by the way, in case you hadn't noticed. Hands under thighs, rings and noses. These things fascinate me because I don't remember them ever being taught of when I was growing up, and they should really be talked about a lot more because they're awesome. So I want to read, actually, um, something that I think is important to understand. First point is that Rebecca's story is the story of Israel. See, the fact that she was brought in and given these bracelets and the nose ring and stuff and all the obedience went on. Her story becomes, the reason this story is so important is it becomes a type of what we see God doing with the nation of Israel. This story is showing God working what he did in a person he's going to do for a nation. Ezekiel, the prophet, says this in chapter 16. This is at the, actually at the long end of a story how God saw Israel by the side of the road and took care of them, really reminiscent of the story of the prodigal son that Jesus tells in the New Testament. If you want to read that story in the Old Testament, go to Ezekiel uh, chapter 16. It's really God saying the story of the prodigal where Israel is, or not the prodigal, the story of the, uh, what's the good Samaritan, that's what I meant. The story of the good Samaritan where the good Samaritan, the guy's by the side of the road and beaten up. And God says, hey Israel, I saw you were by the road beaten up and I passed by, nobody's taking care of you, I took care of you, right? So he sort of really tells this story of the good Samaritan in Ezekiel, that was what he did for Israel. And Jesus retells that in the, in the New Testament, really kind of a lot we could go through there. But he goes on in verse 8. When I passed by you again, this is after that story, and saw you, behold, you were at the age for love. I spread the corner of my garments over you and covered your nakedness. I made my vow to you and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Lord God, Yahweh, and, be you, and you became mine. He's speaking to Israel. Then I bathed you with water and washed off your blood from you and anointed with you with oil. I clothed you also with embroidered cloth and shut and shod you with fine leather. I wrapped you in fine linen and covered you with silk. And I adorned you with the ornaments and put bracelets on your wrists and a chain on your neck. And I put a ring in your nose. And, see, I'm going somewhere with that. And earrings in your ears and a beautiful crown on your head. So he's taking these cultural symbols that they understood to be signs of marriage and covenant relationship. And God's saying, just like with Rebecca. When the servant saw her and she fulfilled all these things that he saw in God, he gave her these jewelry and ornaments. But that wasn't just stuff. These were symbols of things that people understood culturally was committing her to these relationships. I mean, it took more detail. She had to commit and there's family and stuff. But these became symbols of, of these relationships that were significant culturally. So much so that God says, hey, Israel, I did all these things, cleaned you up, put a ring on your nose. I made you mine, right? So Rebecca becomes this illustration, I think, of what God would then do with Israel. But Re Rebecca's story is also a story of the church. See, collectively, as the church, God, like the story of the, you know, the, the guys beat up inside, you know, this good Samaritan type thing, that's, that's us, that's the church. God is saying, God, because this idea of the bride what does the New Testament say that we are as the church? We are the bride of Christ, waiting for his return. And God's saying, look, church, I put you together. I built you up. I called you out as my people. I'm putting the bracelets on and the nose rings on, all that kind of stuff. Even though it's not really fashionably cool, well, now it is kind of so. That's really awesome that God does it. He was like, he was so ahead of the times, right? So Rebecca's story is the story of the church. But beyond that, Re Rebecca's story is the story of you and me. See, but sometimes we jump too quickly to the you and me part. 
Sometimes we get to that part of, oh, this is, where does it apply to my life and all this stuff. No, no, no. We can't get to that part of applying to us until we work through what these means culturally. How does this then reflect Israel? How does this reflect life in the church? Then I can say this applies to me. Otherwise, we get just a purely selfish faith all about me. But there is no me unless there's a church that I'm a part of. I am individually, I'm not the bride of Christ, but I am a part of the church who is the bride of Christ. But to that degree that I'm a part, that I am a member of that body, I need to be prepared. I need to say, God, am I worthy? Am I somebody who's going to meet your standards and expectations worthy of being called and you putting the ring on my nose? See, even though the calling is based on God's goodness, don't misunderstand. It's not, it's not a salvation by works that I'm talking about. I'm not saying that we have to earn God's love. But yet we see that we have to cooperate with it, just like in this story. God had chosen this person, Rebecca, yet she still had to demonstrate hospitality. She still had to f- say, yes, I will go to receive the things that God will bless her with. And it's the same for us. In Christ, we have been called. We'll do communion. We'll take the bread that represents the body broken as juice for his blood that was shed. And he's done all the work, yet we still have to say, God, I'm ready. I accept the gifts that you're giving me, and I'm going to walk in faithfulness. I'm going to wear that nose ring with pride, right? I am not ashamed. My nose ring for Jesus. Because he has done all these things for me. And God may use the things of our culture. He may use some of those aspects to confirm his call and his purpose in our life. He may use bad things in our life. He'll he'll use it all. But when we say yes and we're willing to go with God, that's when his purpose in our life will be fulfilled. Not until then either. Because God knows. I mean, he can say, okay, I'll wait a year. I'll wait five years. I'll I'll wait 20 years. But my purpose is going to happen. It'll be made complete. So, my challenge for us then is this, is, you know, being worthy of that nose ring, so to speak. Being worthy of that, how God will decorate us with his glory in whatever way that is. And so walking in that worthiness, walking in that call, in our daily choices, the little things that we think don't matter, matter to God. Because in those little things, he does great things beyond what the circumstances are. That's what we see in this story of Rebecca. And so this week, in all those little things that we do, you know, we may not have such outward symbols as Rebecca wore, right? We might not have all the fancy jewelry and stuff on us that say, oh, Rebecca belongs to Isaac. We don't have those things unless we have a little sticker on our car or whatever. Oh, he's a follower of Jesus. But we need those other signs, the fruit of God's presence in our life that will demonstrate to people, oh, wow, this guy belongs to God. You stood before creation, eternity in your hand. You spoke the earth into motion, my soul now. 